All right. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Noel Lyons of uh, noellyons.com, and today I've got the privilege of talking to Paul Moore of Precision Fitness uh, K UK. Uh, just a quick intro on Paul. Uh, Paul was the Portfolio Awards Young Business Person of the Year for 2005-2006. Uh, with a no-nonsense approach to fat loss, he is currently one of only a handful of trainers in the UK who offer 125% money-back guarantee on his services and his systems. Paul is featured in several national newspapers and magazines, as well as on terrestrial TV and radio, with quite a controversial approach at times to fat loss. Um, but he's been described by Men's Health Craig Ballantyne as one of the top UK personal trainers, and by international fitness expert Alan Crosgrove as a superstar trainer. And he's created the revolutionary milk method, which claims to drop a clothes size in less than 28 days or your money back. <laughs> Good morning, Paul. Good morning, Noel. How are you, sir? Still there after all that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm Brilliant. very excited, but I'm also blushing behind me PC. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Okay, Paul, let's get straight into this, because I'm, I'm always keen to put a lot of content into these calls. Uh, I mean, you're quite open on your website. Um, you, you haven't always been in shape yourself, have you? There, there was a time when you were actually quite out of condition. Yes, I was, um, I was the proverbial cuddly guy. <laughs> right. um, Basically, I left school and got pushed into a job that, didn't, that I didn't want to do in a factory. Um, met a girl, stopped playing sports, and next thing I knew, I was, I was on about a 44-inch waist. Um, to cut a long story short, I tried everything that I knew to get into shape. Some of it worked, some of it didn't. Um, then I got down with a 34-inch waist, then I became a personal trainer. Obviously, it's quite as easy as that, but um, that's the way I got around with it. So I basically know what it's like to be out of shape. I know how, how long of a road it is to get there, so it makes it... A little bit more. It makes it a little bit easier for me to relate with people when I train them. Yeah, yeah. Because I think a lot of trainers out there have been in. They need personal trainers, can't they? Yeah, I think I think a lot of a lot of personal trainers. I mean, obviously it's nothing against them, but they've they've came from a sporting background. They went to university. They played sports while they were at university, and they've been fit all their lives. And I haven't really had the the the, the, uh, there's a fat person waiting to get out with me constantly. (laughs) <laughs> no, I've had it thrown all the time. It's like, oh, it's so easy for you, Noel, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. you know, the difference is, too, I commit every day. I, I literally yeah. plan my exercise first and then my yeah. day around it. <laughs> yeah. That's where Absolutely. I'm at. And what, was yeah. there a decisive turning point for you at all? You know, any... um, I've seen myself on a, on, a, on a video of a friend's engagement party, who's right. since that engagement party has been married twice now, and that's got anything to do with the conversation. But I've seen myself on a video, and I was like, oh, who's that fat lad? And it was me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and the difference today, I needed to talk about it. The difference today, Paul, and how you live and how you, you know, ex- The difference today, again, my my health takes, I mean, it doesn't take preference over my client's health, but I'll, I'll schedule a time in the day where I feel good at the train, and then I'll fit everything else around that. Right, right. And I'm still a little bit naughty on the weekend, which I think is a, is a, big, is a big topic that I'm going to talk about today as well, rewarding yourself. That, that would be good because uh, I'm big on that too. I think you know, yeah. you've, got to, you've got to be real. You've got to be living a life as well. Exactly. So, balance that. So, okay, awesome. let's, let's talk about starting out because we're literally starting out now on a 10-week program um, uh-huh. to sort of establish a baseline for everybody listening. Yeah. Uh, what, you, you hear a lot about different measurements like body fat percentage, BMI, waist to hip, waist to height ratio, etc., etc. Yeah. What, what do you, I mean, you work one-on-one and you work with groups. What measurement yeah. do you recommend? Well, I've actually, I've got two ways that I do it. Um, I must also state that I like to be quite controversial, and I apologise if I swear at any point, but I'm sure you'll edit that out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> <but> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I must say that BMI is absolute bull crap. Right. Um, I won't go anywhere near BMI. I won't go anywhere near um, those machines that apparently send an electrical impulse through your body, but still ask for your weight and your height, uh, right. which I can't understand why anyone will buy. And there's still health clubs out there who are doing this and telling people this is their body fat and they're obese, etc, etc. Um, I always say this, guys like Brad Pitt and Johnny Wilkinson are classes overweight on the BMI. So that yeah. shows you how far you that is. Um, so I'll not go too far in that, but the, the way I test it is I take it's circumferential measurements of, of different points on the body. So I'll take waist, hip, chest measurement, I'll take thigh me- measurements, because um, they're, they, they're more vanity area, so they're more visual. Um, but I'll also take, on my one-to-one clients, I take 12 body fat sites. Um, which are known as what, what Charles Polygon is one of the, probably in my opinion the best trainer in the world. Um, he calls them the biosignature sites. 
Um, so we we take those twelve with um, Hartman and body fat calipers, which are known to be the most accurate calipers. Can somebody take them themselves. There is a skill to that, isn't there? So but, probably. Yeah, yeah, there is a skill. I mean, to take it themselves out with with in a group situation. Obviously, I don't have time to take twelve sites on people, so I take four. I'll yeah. take a tricep site, a bicep site, um, a super iliac site, which for those of you out there that don't know is the low handle site, um, and the subscapular site, which is just below the shoulder blade. This um, is gonna... I've also you just used like a, a thumb and a finger, and I've asked yeah, people to take it themselves yeah. because they can pretty much gauge, you know, the, the the front of the arm, the back of the arm. Yeah, so absolutely. So literally just pinch an inch or a few. Yeah. Yeah, I would recommend that as well. I mean, as long as they're taken from the same places, um, they're doing it regularly at similar times, uh, um, then it's always a good gauge. And another gauge is to take a photo as well because it's easy for a, it's easy for people to look in the mirror because they can convince themselves of what they see in the mirror. But take sure. a photo. Yeah. Take a photo and you take a lot. You talk a lot about helping people look good naked. Yeah. <laughs> Which, <laughs> let's not go too, too deep on that. But, um, I mean, <laughs> is that what you recommended? You take a picture literally, um, you know, in, in minimal clothing? In minimal yeah. clothing, take a picture. There's nothing more powerful. When you, when you want to reach for the hobnobs or the Pringles, then there's nothing more powerful than that photo of you looking um, not so good naked. <laughs> And if you've ever been really, really in good shape too, to have that photo to hand as well somewhere? Absolutely, absolutely. Compare the two. You need, some, you, need a, you need a picture of where you want to be and a picture of where you've been. Brilliant, brilliant. So um, you would recommend the um, taking some waist measurements, some chest measurements, hip measurements? Absolutely. And take a that, uh, before picture with Saucy today. Absolutely. Have another uh, picture to hand of something you aspire to of when you have really been yes. in good shape? Yeah, I, I actually... For, for me, the summer has a period, obviously, where you have to wear tighter clothes, take your top off, etc. if you're a male, that is. Um, so I actually have a powerful, I have a picture on my desktop of the guy from 300. Right. The movie. Uh, yeah. um, and that's sort, of a, that's sort of a goal for me, to have visible abdominals like that. Because, I mean, over the winter, even as a trainer, you tend to carry a little bit more body fat anyway. But, um, sure. And sometimes being a trainer, you know, the last thing you want to do is train, <laughs> which is quite difficult. A lot of people can't understand that. Brilliant. Okay. Um, how about fitness tests? Fitness tests. I mean, because I don't deal with because I don't deal with my specialisation is in just pure aesthetics. It's basically looking, making people better look look better naked. Sorry. Um. So I actually don't do any specific fitness tests because I don't need to. If yeah. people there was, if I, I'm obviously qualified to train people to get fitter and train people to run marathons and climb mountains and rehab from um, heart surgery and. Stuff, but that's not what I do anymore. I've decided quite early on in my career that I needed to specialise in something. And when I say train, I to um, specialise in nine or ten different things. I'm thinking, well, you really can't be a specialist in all of those things. Yeah. So that's a, that's a long that's a long answer to a really short question. <laughs> <laughs> but I think we should point out too that a lot of the the so-called fitness tests they're actually not really that accurate, are they? No. Well, I love the one where you have to squeeze. You know, the strength test where you squeeze something. Yeah, just, just like well, the hang- unless your goal unless your goal is to be better at squeezing things, what's the point in it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and a lot of the cardio fitness tests. Well, I know you're going to be talking about cardio later. Yeah. But a lot of the cardio tests on the machines. Yeah, I mean, I don't like them at all. Yeah. So again, it all think, depends on what your goal is. But again, my 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 goal is to make people look better naked, and obviously with their clothes on as well. They don't have to be naked. But the, the fitness tests are, are fairly irrelevant for what I do. So you, you get to see incremental improvements session by session, don't you? I take, the, I take the body fat sessions every session. The body fat measurements every single session, the skin falls every single session. But um, I find even in terms of what exercises people can and can't do and how well they perform them, you yeah. see a different session on session. Absolutely. Range of motions, um, how many reps they get out on a full push-up, etc., etc. And to me, it's those small improvements session by session that are far more meaningful. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so what, another point I must make is that I would, if I was you guys, measure yourself on a on a Monday morning, because what I find is with my Monday morning clients, those are the ones that get the best results. Because on the weekend, if if you've got a client that you see every Friday on the weekend, they may be a little bit naughty because they know they've got from the Monday to Friday to make up for it. Whereas okay. if you see them on a Monday morning, they tend to be a little bit stricter on a weekend. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> And what, what about uh, nutrition, Paul? Do you do you encourage people to take a three-day, seven-day food diary? Nutrition-wise, they take a seven-day food diary, um, and if they don't get it to me on a Monday, um, for two weeks running, they're out without a refund. 
Right. Because it's the only way, it's the only control that I have. Yep. Is to is is keep a food diary and an exercise diary. And do you find people are honest? Um, yes, because they know what's expected when they first signed up, and um, because I know a little bit about why people store body fat where they store it, I can tell whether they're cheating. For instance, it's been found that the sub, the sorry, the super iliac measurement, which is your low handle, is directly correlated to how many carbohydrates you're taking. So if people are lying about the carbohydrate intake. That area will not budge. Righty, righty, okay. Okay, so starting out, you recommend a few basic measurements, yep. a photo. Yep. Don't bother with a fitness test, nope. um, but definitely start uh, being aware of the seven-day food sort of intake that you're taking in. Write everything down, and times are very important as well. Okay, because? Because well, it's very important that you eat every three to four hours just basically for metabolism. I think right, everyone, so everyone knows the little and often rule now, but for those of you out there that don't, you should eat little and often without a shadow of a doubt. Because that keeps the blood sugar levels constant? Yeah, it constant. keeps the blood yeah. sugar levels constant, it keeps feeding your body with nutrients and it stops you from gorging. Brilliant. Okay. Okay, so we're starting out. Today is day one. How soon can we expect to see results? I have people who get results in the first three days, depending on what sort of diet they're following, but the type of, the, the, the type of diet that my clients follow gets very rapid results straight away because I, I basically ban anything that is in toxic in nature. So anything with wheat in, anything, so, sorry, not all dairies banned, milk and cheese are both banned, um, low-fat yogurts banned, sugars banned, processed foods banned, and obviously alcohol banned. So the tendency, depending on how bad they were eating before, the tendency very rapid results. Um, and is that indefinite? You, you, you know, you literally put them on a detox diet, that's it, or is it just the first 30 days? First 30 days, and then we start introducing those foods again and seeing how the body reacts. Um, so literally, we'll start off, say it's bread they're craving, obviously they'll never touch white bread again. <laughs> so they'll, right. they'll, they'll reintroduce maybe a, a slice of wholemeal bread or a wholemeal pitta. They'll, they'll yep. note for the next day how their body reacts to that, so they may feel bloated, they may get a headache, they may feel sick, they may get a dry mouth. So they basically have to write down how the body is reacting to this. If they have no reaction, then they'll go to two slices of bread. Then if they have no re reaction to that, that's fine. If they do have a reaction, then they know that one slice of bread a day is their limit. I think people say this to me, how can you be so disciplined? Yeah. But if you can eliminate these for 30 days, yeah. when you do actually go back and reintroduce them, yeah. your body doesn't want them because nah. they're junk. Nope. <laughs> I've had one client that had, um, she, had a ch she, she came up bread for 30 days, she had a ciabatta and she had to go to bed for an hour and a half after she ate it. Right. I had a guy that came up caffeine and couldn't get out of bed for three days. Right. His headaches were that bad because his body was relying on caffeine to run. And those two people got fantastic results, by the way. Right, right. Okay. So, obviously, we've got 10 weeks here, haven't we? And, you, you know, you're literally getting results within the first week. Yeah. But, I mean, traditionally, we always say allow four to six weeks to see real significant yeah, lasting yeah, yeah. changes. Yeah. So, we, we, we've been a little bit lenient here. We've given ourselves 10 weeks because yeah. we're trying to get results from everybody on yeah. this. Um, you know, with, with that in mind, let's start talking through exercise. Um, I mean, Paul, I mean, you've been quite vocal on cardio, and I think it's a good thing. Yeah. Can you talk us through what is appropriate cardio to be doing nowadays? <laughs> oh, I'm going to, I, might, I might start rambling and, and salivating at the mouth and glazing up. Yeah, how long have we got? <laughs> I get really excited about this. And basically, okay, the first thing I must say is, next time you guys go to the gym, have a look at the cardio section, and then have a look at the weight training section. And have a look at the, the different physics in each section. You'll notice that all of the more overweight people are training on the cardio, and all of the leaner people are training weights. There's a reason why that happened. And they're normally walking on the treadmills, aren't Absolutely. they? Absolutely. I seen a guy on Monday when I was actually doing my own training, and he was sitting on a bike reading a magazine. <laughs> and he'd be one of the first that complains that he doesn't get results. Right. Um, actually, okay, so, so what's going on there? What's going on there? I'm just, I just want to come out with a little bit of a, 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 a quote first. Last year in Men's Fitness Magazine, Newcastle was shown as the fourth fattest city in the UK, um, which is obviously good for me as a trainer, but not good for the city as a whole. However, it had the highest percentage of gym members. Okay. Second highest percentage of gym So that basically means that a lot of people are gym members in Newcastle, but yet we're the fourth fattest city. So I've, I've got a few theories about that and why, why that happens. I think it's because in gyms you've got a cookie cutter off-the-shelf approach, basically everybody gets the same program, um, yeah. and 
a lot of the programs, I'd say 95% of the programs are based around the aerobic exercise. Um, right. Now, in short, aerobic exercise can make you fatter. Um, I've got study after study upon this, and Noel, you've probably seen some of them anyway. Um, the belief is that aerobic exercise yeah. will burn fat as it burns calories in the fat burning zone. Um, the fat burning zone is not that complicated, but I don't want to delve too deep into it. But basically, that's what is probably in your gym program at the minute. The typical gym program looks like... I think it's a myth perpetuated by the machines, isn't it? Because uh, they myth. Myth it. it is an absolute myth. I think that, that the, the calories burn thing on the machine is absolute bull as well. I think they, they just make that up. <laughs> I'm sure. I always tell people it's how hard the machines work. <laughs> it's you. exactly how hard the machines yeah, is. The machines also work for you anyway. Um, but I think your typical gym program says 10 minutes on the cross trainer, 10 minutes on a bike, 10 minutes walking on the treadmill, 5 minutes on the rower, and then lie on the floor and nod your head for a while and do supposed abdominal exercises. Um, again, yeah. that clearly doesn't work. Um, so what we're saying about aerobic exercise is that it makes you efficient. Um, your, your body becomes efficient in aerobic exercise. Now that sounds great. Um, but think about it, if your car is efficient at burning fuel, does that mean it burns more fuel or less fuel? It means it burns less fuel. Um, so basically your body becomes efficient at a rubber exercise, which means it burns less fuel. The reason for that is because it is my belief, and it's a lot of other trainers and fat loss experts believe, is that a rubber exercise eats into muscle tissue um, via the hormone cortisol. Now the more, the more muscle tissue you've got, the higher your metabolism is, the less body fat you have. So in short, aerobic exercise burns calories while you're doing it, but doesn't do anything for the other 23 hours of the day. Does that answer your yeah. question, Noel? Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm thinking as I listen to people. I think I'm trying to tease hours. out a couple of key points there. Uh, I think one, you know, aerobic exercise and strength training, there's two different processes going on yeah. within the body, and they certainly do compete against yeah. each other. Whereas if you ever sit down with a bodybuilder, they actually go through phases of cardio training and pure muscle yeah. building because they never do the two so, yeah. you know, together. And yet in gyms, you're actually encouraged to always do yeah, the two yeah. together. And they do compete against yeah, each I other. Think I, I, can't, I mean, obviously people say that I hate aerobic exercise. Aerobic exercise has its place. It'll make you feel better. It'll make you fitter. It'll improve your heart and lungs. But for, from a pure fat loss perspective, yeah. it's virtually useless and is, in my um, opinion, counter, well. it's counterproductive. <laughs> I know, I know you're quite sort of outspoken on this, but I mean, I'm, I'm a triathlete. I still believe there's a yeah, place for aerobic absolutely. exercise. And, and, and my take on the second point is, and the one you made very well, is that um, people always do the same intensity. They, they always go in there, and it's always at low level. It's normally 60 to 70% yeah, percent of their total maximum yeah. capacity, and they sit there for anywhere between 10 minutes and yeah. 60 minutes. Four of that normally. Same level. Same stimulus, same stress on the body every single yeah, session, and yet they expect to see results. I think another point that gets lost is that all cardio isn't aerobic, whereas all aerobic is aerobic. So the, this is the, right. I think this is the next point that you want us to make is that aerobic exercise is, again, not that good for fat loss, but what is fantastic for fat loss is anaerobic exercise. So this is more your, your in, which is still cardio. Cardio has two things. We've got aerobic, which means with oxygen. So you can exercise, you're exercising with oxygen, anaerobic, which in essence means without oxygen. Anaerobic training is the type of training that you may do in a spinning class or something like that, where we basically take the body out of its comfort zone, then recover. Out of its comfort zone, then recover. For fat loss, that is and super. Let, oh, okay, just stop you one second. I think the key point there is you, you'll know when you're going anaerobic purely yeah. because holding a conversation <laughs> suddenly gets yeah. a lot harder. And your lungs don't feel like they're coming out of your mouth, so that's fine. <laughs> okay. Right. Whereas aerobic, generally, you can hold yeah. a conversation and everything's yeah. relatively easy. The typical aerobic exercise for so, me is the ladies oh. in the in the pool who are doing head or breaststroke while talking to their friend. Yeah. Yeah. Like, absolutely. Um, or they're on the treadmill holding onto the thing, reading a magazine. <laughs> just what I seen the other day. I've just got a study in front of us, Noel. If I'd like to make a quote, this is my favourite one. Um, it's a it's right. a bit of Good. research that I think was taken from the International Journal of Sports Nutrition, and. It okay. has got, this is the research, 20 weeks aerobic training versus 15 weeks interval training. The guys in the, in the aerobic training group burned 28,661 calories. The guys in the interval training group, so the anaerobic training group, burned 13,614 calories, which is basically less, less than half the calories than the guys in the aerobic training group. 
What they've shown, what, what they showed was that the interval training group showed a nine times greater loss in fat than the aerobic group, despite burning less than half the amount of calories. So for me, that shows that it isn't about the calories burned in the session; it's about the other 23 hours of the day. So for me, it's about yep. we're going to go into this later on. It's about creating metabolic disturbance, or what Alan Cosgrove would call after burning, what Craig Valentine would call turbulence. Yeah, okay, so the key thing is um, where you think you're getting the benefits yeah. when you're exercising, and yet research is now showing the benefits occur with the three to four hours after yeah. exercise and in the time it's in almost, between sessions. Some of it's been shown to, to, to your body's still burning calories from some sessions up to three days later. Your body's still repairing yeah. itself from some sessions up to, up to 72 hours later, which for me is compared to your aerobic exercise, which yeah, burns calories while you're doing it, but does little else. Okay, let's just qualify interval work because we're, we're not telling you that you, you know, you've got to yeah. work eyeballs out. Absolutely. It's, it's all relative, Absolutely. isn't it? I mean, the typical thing that I start my clients off with is something very, very simple, like stepping onto the bottom stair at home for one minute pretty quick and then slowing it down and taking it really easy for one minute. And then repeat that six to eight times and that's a great starting point. Skipping's also a great starting point. Skip pretty hard for a minute, have total rest for one minute. That is super difficult. Actually. And skip it quick because it's going to Absolutely, the legs absolutely too, fantastic it? exercise. A typical example is when you first start, when you first start going out jogging, because jogging would typically be classed as an aerobic exercise, but for somebody that's out of shape, jogging is not an aerobic exercise. So interval training for somebody that's out of shape would be maybe jogging for two lampposts, walking for two lampposts. That's a great example of what people do when they think they're not fit, but that is having a great effect on their fitness. And the, the good thing about interval training is that it can be done working the same intensity all the time. You can change your rest period, you can change your exercise, you can change how long you work for, you can change how many intervals you do. It's pretty much endless. That, that, that's really important, isn't it? There's actually lots of ways to Absolutely. vary your training session. So if you are going in and doing the yeah. same one every time, yeah. you need to ask yourself why. Probably, I, I had this discussion with a client the other day, and they're always like, Paul, I don't like this exercise. Now, I typically think that the exercise that people don't like tend to be the ones that are the most effective ones. There's a reason why they don't okay. like it. It's because it's the one that's most effective for their body. Um, I had a guy who, who I wanted to do pullovers in the gym. Um, he had really poor range of yep. motion in his shoulders, and he just avoided the exercise. But it would have been the most effective exercise okay. he could have done. Yeah. And, and what's the feedback afterwards? I mean, once you've broken them out their comfort zone, if you like, the, the it, you know, should it... I never enjoy exercise, but I think it's one of those things where it's um, it's 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 short-term displeasure for long-term pleasure. I love that saying. It's short-term okay. displeasure for long-term pleasure because it's, I think that's a great point. Some of these interval sessions are only four minutes long, by the way. So, for instance, there's a few exercises where we do the old Tabata protocol, where it's 20 seconds on, 10 seconds off, repeated eight times for a total of four minutes. That is an absolutely superb protocol. If somebody tells me they can't find right. four minutes a day, then the, the the lion. <laughs> or they need to reassess their They need to reassess what they're doing with the 24 hours that everybody's got. Okay. So, um, obviously, definitely, they, they, people want to be mixing up their, yeah. their training. Where does weight uh, fit into this? Where does resistance, resistance training, training for me is vital. This is, nobody in my, it, nobody that comes to train with me does any cardio training for the first two weeks if they work one-on-one -on -one because they need to get their body almost working properly again. 95% of the people that I see, their, their, their glutes don't even contract properly. So they end up with tight backs, they can't squat properly. And basically, there's other, there's other muscles in there. Yes, they don't even know where the don't, glutes are, do they? <laughs> that sort of thing. You say, okay, yep, crack your glutes. Exactly. Now, huh? <laughs> exactly. Um, but we, we start with bodyweight exercises. One of the things that grates on me in the gym is I see a, a guy who's lifting huge weight on a bench press but can't do 10 push-ups. Why, why lift heavy weights when right. you can't lift your bodyweight? Um, the first two... Yeah. So I kind of joke, you know, you almost reintroduce yeah, people to their body. Unbelievably effective. And, again, yeah. you don't need to be in a gym. You don't need any equipment to do it. All the programs that I write for my clients can be done at the gym or at home. So they can't ever say, I didn't get time to go to the gym. But why do they need to do it at home? Because I think the time element, time is the biggest excuse that people give. I didn't have time. So if you take that away from somebody, the almost exercise becomes a habit. It's no longer a chore because they haven't got the time thing. The longest program I write is 35 minutes long. Um, the first two exercises that I introduce are a basic bodyweight squat, um, which I'm sure you'll have videos of on the Ning site, and a basic bodyweight push-up. Um, because those are two of the most effective exercises you can do, not only for strength, 
but for fat loss as well because they recruit a lot of muscle fibers um, and they're, they're great for metabolic disturbance, so they burn a lot of calories after. Um, so we bring that in pretty much straight away. Okay, because that's actually one of the questions I was going to ask you later. I had a, a Mary from Bristol says, you know, okay, I know that squats and lunges yeah. are the best for turning legs. Uh, how do you make mm, it more interesting? Well, there's, a lot of different, there's a lot of different things that you can do with a squat and a lot of different things that you can do with a lunge, none of which are pleasant. <laughs> none of which are pleasant. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a thing that we call the leg matrix. You know, okay, well, I mean, let's start. It's not, um, yeah. okay, I know you do boot camps, but um, I mean, surely after a while people do start to enjoy exercising with you because I, I found it initially it's the hardest thing is breaking Absolutely. the habit of not doing anything. But once you get past so many weeks, it yeah, does yeah, start to so become more pleasurable, I think, surely. I think my goal is to basically make a client not need me anymore. I, I have, I have cli- yeah. trainers who say, oh, I've trained this client for like seven years, and I'm thinking, well, for me, that's not good. That's not, I mean, some people just like spending time with the trainer, but my goal is for the client not to need me anymore. Basically, just need me for yeah. a, maybe a program review or to write them a new program. They shouldn't need me to come and count reps for them and motivate them anymore. I've got that to do, and I'm sure they have as well. Okay. Um, Maybe that's why you beat them so hard. That I, poor, I, don't but okay. I, just, I like to I like to set them a challenge. Um, well, another thing that we do is a workout called, called the 300 workout, which is basically it, it's sort. Of, I mean, it's not taken from the movie 300, but we use that as a logo, the, the 300 logo. Um, and we basically okay. have 15 exercises. We do 20 reps of each exercise, no rest, and we time that. That's a that's a goal that was set up for clients after they've worked with us for six weeks. Beat you three hundred times, because um, I think it's nice to have right. challenges like that as well. Yeah, well, it goes back to the fitness test. That's a far Absolutely. more meaningful Absolutely. fitness it's, test, isn't it? It's sort of it's it's more specific to them as well, rather than I, I hate things where you put them against um, what are, like standards. I think I think you want to be challenged against yes. yourself and not compared to a, a norm, because I, I I don't know where the norms come from. Yes. That's, yeah, no, really good point. Uh, there, there's all these standards and percentages out there, but <laughs> you oh, really you are really competing against yourself. Because then you're the you're the person who's putting the clothes on. You're the person who's standing in front of the mirror. Um, I'm just I'm, I've actually so, just came across a picture of that that I had on one of my presentations the other day, and it, it goes on over exercise, and it, it's basically because okay. a lot of people still don't believe me about this over exercise, no matter how many studies I show them. But a picture obviously paints a thousand words. <laughs> I've got a picture of a, a, a sprinter and a marathon runner. Which one of those two has the least amount of body fat? The sprint has less body fat than a, uh, than a marathon runner. And yet the sprinter will never do a robot exercise. The sprinter probably never sprints for longer than 20 seconds. Yet he's got zero body fat. Whereas the, the marathon runner, although slim, for me, hasn't got a great physique. You very rarely see a marathon runner with six pack no, abs. Most people probably want to experience this. Most, most people probably would have experienced this, wouldn't they? That uh, you can spend an awful lot of time just doing yeah. aerobic exercises, uh, particularly women, because they're almost yeah, scared absolutely. that they're going to build muscle. Absolutely. And yet, yeah, as soon as yeah. you introduce them to weights, and that's why I think body pump was so good for the, you know, for the country as a whole, because as soon as people started taking part in that, yeah. literally their yeah, body I'll, shapes I'll changed. Actually, I make that point quite a lot. I'm not a huge, huge I actually taught body pump for five years. Um, I'm not a... I'm not a massive yes. fan of body pump, <laughs> but what it is that is getting women lifting because? weight. Because? Getting women doing resistance yeah. training is so important because I think you can lose weight and be your goal weight that you've set out for yourself but still look like crap. You see a lot of people like that. Yeah. And, and why would you totally be behind body pump? Because pump? I think it's a lot of reps and I think because you're working in tight and music, your, your, your range yeah. of motion and your, your, your mobility is, quite in, is questionable. I came out of teaching body pump for five years and couldn't squat properly. Because I think... Yeah, it, it yeah, is, it is. I, think, I think the squats in body pump are only it, half squats. So when you, when you try and teach somebody a proper squat, right. you can't do it. But other than that, I think a lot right. of it is very good. Yeah, as I say, part of an overall program, there is a place for going to absolutely, one or two body pump absolutely. classes per week. Just simply because it gets women, especially doing resistance training, and, and I think it teaches great form in almost everything else, apart from squats, because it's rough. Yeah. yeah. So, sorry, we, we didn't actually reply to Mary's question as such, did we? How can we make squats um, more interesting? You can try gauging the depth of your squats. Um, you can try one of the exercises that my clients hate is a, is a jump squat which is basically squatting deep and exploding okay. from the floor, trying to get your feet around about at least two inches off the floor. Um, you can yeah. obviously try a one-legged squat, 
the first thing we do with a one-legged yeah. squat is, is get people to put a ball behind the back, so a Swiss ball behind the back on the wall, because yeah. a one-legged squat is quite difficult to start with. Um, other types of squats you can do, obviously take the feet wider, turn the toes out, etc. Lunges, there's a million different kinds of lunges that you can do. You can do a lateral lunge. Um, one of the exercise, one of the, the things that my clients like to do, well, they don't like to do it, but they find it challenges, a leg matrix. So they'll do, they'll do 24 right. forward lunges, sort of power lunges. Again, what I might do is try and get a video on the on the name site for this. I'm sure there's one out there somewhere. So 24 Good. forward lunges, 24 what we call lateral lunges or side lunges. Um, actually, no, it's not. This is a nice one as well. This is really simple. 24 forward lunges, 24 squats, so normal squats, 12 jumping lunges, okay. which are like an explosive lunge from one leg to the other, and then 12 jump squats. Yes. Yeah, Can I've you done those. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. I have, I have legs like Elvis after I do that one. You know the old shake leg. Oh. <laughs> that that there's, there's a few things that can make it more interesting. You can add weight. You can add um, an exercise that I like to do. I'm not a huge fan of bicep curls because I don't think it's it's a huge it's it doesn't burn many calories, especially for women. And if you take both biceps and triceps, they're very small muscle groups, and so people yeah, spend a lot of time on them. Uh, you know, yeah. relative to the time you're expending, because you I don't really get a big return, In my you? opinion, the bigger the muscle, the more calories it burns, the bigger the movement, the more calories it'll burn. A bicep curl is a very small movement. So what I would like to do is, if you want to work biceps, yeah. do a squat into a bicep curl. So hold the dumbbell, squat, bicep curl. I think that's a wonderful exercise for women. Um, or maybe you squat through yeah, to a shoulder better. press. Great exercise. And you'll find that almost, yeah. that'll, have you, that'll have you gassed as well. You'll be, you'll be pretty much blown on that one as well because it demands a lot of oxygen as well. It goes back to keeping the tempo yeah. of the workout high. Yeah, I think it's all about, too, too fat loss again is all about intensity in the workout. doesn't matter how long you spend doing it, if the workout's intense, it doesn't make any difference whatsoever. I want to be in and out of that gym as fast as I can. Yeah. I do, but... Yeah. Yeah, and it's, as you mentioned earlier, yeah. I mean, you mentioned 35 minutes. How, 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 how does that break down for you? It breaks down for me in that everybody knows about rest periods and our rest periods are important. So what we'll do is we'll pair a lower, lower body exercise with an upper body exercise. So going to the, back to the two classic examples of when you're in the gym, you'll maybe do 12 leg extensions, have a little rest, a little drink, talk to your friend, 12 leg extensions, talk to your friend, whatever, or have a look around at what fit guys are in the gym or what fit women are in the gym. Um, or you could do this. You could do 12 squats followed by 12 push-ups straight off. 12 squats, followed by 12 push-ups. What's happening there is the lower body's resting while the upper body is working. The upper body's resting while the lower body's working. Saves massive amounts of time, and almost when you first start doing that type of training, you will not need to do cardio because your lungs will be working overtime. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it basically is. This cardio, is why we don't add it in for two weeks because people time. can't undo it. And it, you, you wouldn't believe yeah. how much spare time you'll have when you're not spending an hour, to an hour and a half in the gym every day. Have time to plan your food. You'll have time to do the food. I guess it's brilliant. you really maximise sort of every sort of minute because uh, you know I, I, the gym I was at. I, I see a lot of trainers doing yeah. a lot of what we say functional training. Uh, this sort of balance stuff with balls and That's exactly know, what it's like it a balls. circus if you like. <laughs> but uh, they're, they're doing <laughs> they're yeah. doing it with overweight people, and I just think you know that's not the priority yeah. right now. I think that comes I think much later. I've done a lot of that. Yeah, with I think it all depends on what that. the person's goal is. If a person comes to you to lose weight, don't think I'm to. Don't, think about it. Don't get them to kneel on a Swiss ball. It's pretty much it's a waste. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of energy. Um, it's not. It's not really going to achieve that yeah. much for them. Um, if they want, if yeah. the company is, assume, I think this is with the vibration plates as well. Everyone's saying these vibration plates are fantastic, but unless your goal is to be able to stand on something that vibrates for longer and squat on, so say you want to stand on a washing machine as your goal, then they're great. But other than that, I think they're pretty much both. Um, and it's actually been proven that the guys, I mean, this is quite controversial as well, in December I found out that the research that came out, um, the company that ran the research were actually found to be lying about the research and made up the results uh, on those vibration plates. So I'll, really? I'll actually have to get hold of that literature and give people a look at it, because I get asked the question all the time, what do you think of these vibration plates? Um, the answer... I, I, well, it, it's actually a good friend of mine who actually <laughs> runs power plate in the UK. <laughs> But uh, I, I tell you something that the, at LAW, the yeah. biggest fitness trade show in the UK, yeah. it was the busiest stand. So, in my yeah. way of thinking, is you have to ask yourself, what is the attraction? Why are so many yeah. people taking, you know, buy this? And, and yeah. as you just say, would it actually last? Is it well? A year before, would have been the flexi bar going fitness.
there's, there's a, there's, there'll be a busier stand every yep. single year. Um, but if these things, are, in my opinion, if these things are coming, why haven't they been out before? And if they were, they'd be the only thing out there. The same with some of these, some of these other machines. People are like, Paul, this is fantastic, isn't it? I'm like, well, if that worked, there wouldn't be trainers, there wouldn't be gyms, and there wouldn't be diets. I wouldn't have a job if these things worked. Um, if if our belts worked, then there wouldn't be trainers, there wouldn't be other bits of equipment. There would just be our belts. Um, if diets worked, there'd only be one. So I think that's, I think that's a key point. I think I think sure. that a, a lot of these things that come out, there'll be an, there'll be an, there'll be another one every year. There'll be another craze every year. And Let's talk, let's talk results yeah. then, and results you've had with your clients. I mean, obviously you've been running boot camps now, which uh, I fully respect you for. You know, outdoor training in Newcastle in the winter. Six fifteen <laughs> in the morning. Well, no, 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 we're doing one the night time as well. But sixteen, six fifteen oh. in the morning is a test of your character. To say that. <laughs> yeah. Dedication. Um, yeah, you know, take us, I mean, you've mentioned yeah. a few of your workouts, and they sound brilliant. Can you take us okay. a um, few workouts? workouts that we, do. we also do an exercise, a workout called the Accumulator, um, which is quite interesting. These are these are more boot camp style workouts. For for my one-to-one clients, they get a program that's suited to their body that I take from. Um, I write their program from the results of a, a, of a detailed assessment, a kinetic chain assessment, it's called, and um, obviously their bio signature results, which I really want to go and talk about later. Um, but the work that we're doing boot camp, I try and keep it as fun and as different from a gym environment as possible. I mean, a lot of boot camps out there just teach a circuit class. Um, for me, I can't charge what I charge and get the results I do by doing a bloody circuit class. So I need to, I need to keep it as different as I can. Um, another workout that I do is called the accumulator. So we'll start with, um, again, the exercise that we'll do will really be basic because of the work. Um, and they've been around for years, that's why they're still around. So we'll maybe start with a minute's worth of um, squats. We then add in another exercise, so we're actually accumulating exercise. So we'll do a minute's worth of squats, minutes worth of tricep dips. We then do a minute's worth of squats, minutes worth of tricep dips, minutes worth of push ups. We'll generally go on an upper body, lower body scheme, and then we'll build up the five minutes. So by the end, we're doing a minute's worth of squats, a minute's worth of push ups, minutes worth of tricep dips, minutes worth of lunges, maybe a minute's worth of plank at the end. Um, and by the end of those five minutes, you're pretty much goosed. So that's, that's a really fun workout. Um, one of my favourite workouts is the 300 one that I mentioned, but also another one that's called ladders. Um, ladders is basically people work in pairs. I love team games and, and, and games where I pair people up because people get competitive. No matter how many how much people say they're not competitive, when you put them in an exercise environment, they get competitive. Um, it basically takes, makes my job easy because I don't have to motivate very much when I've got people competing. Um, so what we'll do is we'll, we'll, we'll choose one exercise. So we'll, we'll choose an exercise... Um, Probably my favourite exercise for ladies, the Bulgarian split squat, which again we'll try over a bit of video on the name side. And so we'll do person A will do one Bulgarian split squat, person B will do one Bulgarian split squat. Person A will do two, person B will do two, until we get to the number nine. So basically while person A works, person B rests. What it enables is for to choose really tough exercises and break it down into smaller reps. So rather than asking for twenty Bulgarian split squats straight off or breaking it down into smaller numbers and they get a little rest. When the, when the team gets to nine, we then move straight on to the next exercise without a rest. So we've got the whole, the whole room is buzzing with that workout. It's fantastic. Um, again, I'll, I could post that, that on, the, on the Ning site this week easily. I think I've already got a, a, a template of it written out somewhere if anybody wants to have a go at that. But again, you need a partner for that. that yeah, video is, video is awesome. I mean, what we could do is a great one for this is, Husbands yeah. and wives are get, get quite competitive when we do this because we have quite a lot of husbands and wives. So t- if, if anybody's listening, uh, oh, yeah. we get this video <laughs> on the laptop and say, look, let's do this workout together. Um, that would be very interesting. <laughs> yeah, but it is a lot of fun. Yeah. I mean, so, so you can make thoughts. exercise hard and fun at the same time by just um, doing workouts that are different. It doesn't have to be 12 of those, 12 of these, 12 of those, 12 of these. Do some crunches and go home. It doesn't have to be that way. Alrighty. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm going to come on to some questions. I on Ning, or I've just put, been put to me in private. Um, mentioned there's a couple of things yeah. you wanted to talk about, particularly your biosig. You just want to go through those okay, now. Okay. There's a few things on biosig the that I want to talk about. These are basically little, little, almost little cheats that you can do to uh, enhance fat loss from certain areas. For years, trainers will probably still tell you this that you can't spot reduce. Um, what biosig has shown to me, I've been doing it since December. And the great 
Coach Polygon's been doing it for years. Uh, what he found out was when he tested athletes, and this guy he's worked with, I think it's over 100 Olympic medalists, um, he's very impressive. What he found was that his his skin fold measurement that he took from certain areas on the body matched up perfectly with blood work that he ran. Um, so some things that he found were that, like I said before, the low handle area directly correlated to your carbohydrate intake. So if you want to lose fat from the low handle area, control your carbohydrates. Um, and on top of that, your subscapular fat loss, fat, fat area, is, which is just under the shoulder blade, um, is actually a... It's actually a marker of your genetic tolerance to carbohydrates. So you know you'll have friends who are what I call carb bitches, uh, which are basically people that can eat carbs and not put any weight on. I'll guarantee you that their subscapular measurement is low. Mine, unfortunately, isn't low. Um, so I'll, I'll put a stone on just looking at a loaf of bread. Um, honestly, it's unbelievable. So that, that, <laughs> that's two of them. Another one is, is abdominal fat, so fat around the, 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 the abdomen. That's actually what's called a cortisol site. So people that have, have have fat around there, it's more stubborn fat, so it's more, if you're losing from everywhere else and not not this area, it's because you're not getting enough good quality sleep, your body's not good at dealing with stress, or you're doing too much aerobic exercise. Um, so abdominal fat is caused by those three things in the main. How your body deals with stress, how much sleep and how good quality sleep you get, and how much aerobic exercise you do, is, that's, that's why you store fat around your stomach. Those are the three main ones that I wanted to point to. But another one, and I love this one because it works great for ladies. I don't know if you've had this, no, but you get a lot of clients that are lean up a body, but then it's ladies especially who have, um, um, I'm trying to think of a good word for this, a big ass and legs. Um, so basically they carry a lot of body fat around the legs, the ass and the hips. <laughs> That's actually a sign of how um, a body deals with estrogen. Um, so my number one tip for, for, for ladies that carry a lot of fat around there is stop drinking as much lager or booze um, because as we know that's estrogenic. But this is this is going to sound really bizarre, but it works an absolute treat. Is eat more watercress and green vegetables. Um, watercress is actually the gold standard in getting rid of estrogen because estrogen can bind the watercress. So watercress binds with estrogen, and you can actually um, excrete estrogen as well. Um, so my number one point is, is if you're looking to lose body fat from the bones, the thighs, and the hips, in particular, um, eat more things like broccoli, curly kale, cabbage, um, Brussels sprouts, and the, the, but the gold, the gold standard is watercress. So there's, there's my tips on biosignature. Keep in absolutely. the uh, blood pH levels. So absolutely, is it? Not um, too. Is it? A, and a greens drink is superb for that as well. Just taste very. Like, but a green drink is absolutely superb yeah. for reducing fat from that area. Yeah, it's a very, very addictive too, though, very isn't it? Strange, you can mix it with a very strange taste. sort of uh, <laughs> juice. And... <laughs> so what was... Alrighty. So you mentioned uh, questions, no, Paul. Did you want to mention anything else? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Because yeah. there was one on the Ding uh, yeah. community site from uh, Candy. Um, it says, hi, Paul. I keep finding yeah. that I lose a little weight and then stop. I'd like to lose two more inches off my body in my waist, hip, <laughs> and thighs, and arms. You've just been talking about that. Um, I have lost weight, but I'm afraid I will stagnate and just maintain this weight and not lose any more. What can I do to reach my goal of losing two more inches by my birthday, second week in May? I'd be happy just to lose just another inch by then. I don't mind the journey of weight loss. My wor worry is really not seeing the inches Fantastic. coming off anymore. Okay. I want to see more results. Um, Candy's obvi obviously listening. Go. So it's yeah. The question, back the though, question is obviously I don't know what Candy's doing at present. I don't know what diet she's doing. I don't know what training she's doing. But my first point would be to, to, to not focus on the weight. Um, the weight at this point, if you've lost quite a lot of weight, isn't important whatsoever. Um, Alan Cosgrove posted something on his blog not so long ago about the fat loss machine. If you could go into a machine and come out weighing the same but looking completely different, would you be happy? Or would you rather come out looking like crap and reading the correct scale weight that you want to read? Because those two things are huge. So stop focusing on weight. Focusing on inches is absolutely fine, by the way. Um, which is what I'm going to talk about now. I'm going to, I wanted to go through this. I wanted, this article was actually on my website about seven sneaky little tips that you can do to burst through plateaus. Most people, when they, when they stagnate, when they're training, Good. they'll do a few things. They'll either train harder in the session, they'll either train longer, which for me is what a lot of people do because if you're in a gym, your, your next gym program will be about an hour and a half long. You'll either train more days of the week, you'll either cut back on calories, which is a cardinal sin, 
or you'll give up your social life. Um, I wouldn't advise any of those things um, because number one, you probably haven't got time. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't fancy being tight to a treadmill. Some people, some people that I see in the gym may as well have their mattress in the gym because they live there. Um, it's absolutely tough, and I think people do. It's still important for people to have a life and lose fat at the same time. But here's here's some some tricks that I like to do with clients when the plateau. Um, I, I try and get them to get to bed before 10.30, um, at least five nights a week. Um, because, as I said before, poor quality sleep and lack of sleep can be um, a real contributor to the way you store your fat around your stomach. Um, when you go to bed too late, which a lot of people do, especially if they exercise on a night time, I find that people who exercise quite late at night can't get to bed late because they can't unwind. Um, you basically, you've got, you've got hormones that help you burn fat. And these hormones work when you're asleep. Um, and I actually looked at a bit of research recently that said if you woke up between the hours of 1 and 3, that, that shows that your body has a toxic liver because um, your liver cleanses between the hours of 1 and 3. So just make a note of that. If you're waking up between 1 and 3, then you have a toxic liver and you need to seriously do a liver cleanse. Um, but your, your body will really struggle to, sh to shed off excess fat if you're going to bed after 10.30, um, which is... Sleep can, Charles Pollock can think that the number one factor in any fat loss program is how good you sleep or, or how well you get to bed. He said that it comes ahead of diet and exercise and for him, he's, he's been the highest paid fitness trainer in the world since 1994. So for him to say that is, is quite um, significant. Um, so that's my first point, try and get to bed before 10.30. Um, take more fish oil. I, I write quite a lot of articles with fish oil. Um, and people, people say, pour up all fish oil, I'm taking one a day like the tub recommends. This is going to, this is, I've had to take a deep breath before I say this, but you need to take more than nine fish oil tablets a day. Um, basically, the main point I'll, I'll say with fish oil is, um, fish oil turns on your fat burning genes and turns off your fat burning genes, your fat burning enzymes. Um, fish oil can also balance our blood sugar level, which is what it's fantastic for. Um, because the, the, the less insulin you produce in large doses, the more your body will burn fat. And fish oil is also great for reducing carbohydrate cravings. And uh, fish oil is actually, this has been proven that fish oil will help any known disease. Any known disease to man will be helped by taking fish oil. So take at least nine fish oil tablets a day. Have you got any questions on those two things, first of all, no? I'm, I'm fully behind fish. I'm just thinking, obviously, surely fresh fish, uh, is, yeah, uh, fresh 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 fish, fish is, is better fresh than Fresh fish something. is better. It's quite difficult to get, to get large amounts in. So but, I would always say eat fresh fish, um, but still take right. fish oil capsules without a shadow of a doubt. That the more expensive your fish oil tablets are, the better, by the way, because the quality is quite questionable. Um, the, the best type of fish oil is um, sure. you want to be taking it. You want to have a look on the back of the tub, um, and it should, it should contain both EPA and DHA. And you want a 3 to 2 ratio of EPA to DHA. Those are the best ones for health and burn fat. Um, sure. There's, there's a lot of um, press coverage yeah. about how contaminated fish is nowadays. I, I, mean, would, I would just say that again, the fresher the fish, the better. Um, um, obviously, everybody can't afford to eat it organic, but the fresher you can get sure. it, the better. I'll, I'll, I'll always get me fish from a fishmonger um, because you know it's going to be fresher. I'll always get me my right. meat from a butcher's. Um, I'll always get my, my veg. I, would not, I wouldn't go to a supermarket for all that because they want to keep it for longer. Sure. Okay. So, this is a couple this more. Is quite a bizarre, this is quite a bizarre one, but it works. As I said before, um, around about 90% of people that I see and do a test on, it's actually called a neurological fire and order test. 95% um, of people that I see, the butt cheeks don't contract properly. Um, it, it can cause all sorts of problems. It can cause low back pain, knee pain, lack of pelvic control. It can, actually, it can actually make your stomach look bigger than what it is because it causes what's called anterior pelvic tilt, um, which is also caused by doing crunches, by the way, may I add. Um, but I'll not go into that too much. Anyway, um, so basically what I'm trying to say is that people need to squeeze their bum cheeks together. People, people have talked about this in the past, but the more somebody can squeeze their bum cheeks together in a day, the better. Do it before your workout, do it after your workout, and do it as many times as possible during your workout. Put your bum cheeks together, hold it for 10 seconds in a standard position, and repeat that five times. I'll do it with clients in between sets, in between exercises, um, and that's actually the first thing they do before the start of session is squeeze their glutes. Absolutely good glute awareness. I like that word. Glute awareness. I like that. <laughs> um, 
Another point that I'd like to make is, is don't be scared of eggs. Um, I eat around about eight eggs a day. Eggs are fantastic. Obviously, the ones with omega-3 are not better. Um, there's a few studies that I've looked at with eggs as well. Um, the first thing that clients always say to me, Paul, is, are you sure it's okay for me to be eating this many eggs? My doctor said I shouldn't be eating a certain amount of eggs. Um, and the, this is quite controversial as well, but you know me. Um, do not be scared of eggs. What your doctor is telling you is pretty much bullshit. And I probably shouldn't have said that word, but it's bull crap, sorry. Um, anyway, um, the studies that <laughs> the studies that were done on eggs improving your cholesterol were actually by the cereal board. Um, and people say, well, what does that mean? I say, well, what I'm saying is the people that make cereal studied the funding to show that eggs are bad for you. Sorry, they funded the, um, the studies to show that eggs are bad for you. What, what these studies showed was that eggs increased your cholesterol, but it actually increases your good cholesterol, um, which is awesome. And there's a study that was done at um, Harvard University by a guy called Dr. David Ludwig, and he studied three groups of overweight individuals. There was a group that ate, um, they basically had to eat what they had for their breakfast, they ate exactly the same thing for lunch, and then for the rest of the day, they were allowed to eat what they want. Um, there was three groups. One of them ate an instant porridge, so, sorry, instant oats. One of them ate what's called steel cut oats, which is the type that you have to cook in a pan. Um, and the other group ate a veggie omelette. Um, the group that ate, ate the veggie omelette ate 51% less for the rest of the day than the group that ate steel cut oats. So that's 51% less. But check this one out. The group that ate the porridge, the instant oats, which is what everybody in this country has, regardless of whether that's Scots oats or not, nearly everybody in this country eats instant oats. The group that ate the porridge for the rest of the day ate 81% more than the group that ate the omelette. So for me, that's quite substantial. So the, the number one thing that I would say is have eggs for breakfast. And people that say they haven't got time to eat eggs for breakfast, get up earlier. If you've got time to stick porridge in the microwave for 30 seconds, you've got time to make scrambled eggs, which takes about three minutes max. And you've got time to make an omelette, which takes three minutes max as well. So just get up. If you can't get up three minutes earlier, there's something wrong with you. Yeah. Or don't press. Or so don't press. So early many get times. Up early. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Should we just finish by mentioning okay, crunches? I mean, are crunches, crunches dead? For, for a few reasons. <laughs> know, Number one, how many calories do you think you burn sitting on the floor, nodding your head? You don't burn any. Um, I've got a few things to say about crunches. But if crunches worked, wouldn't they be the only exercise you did? Hmm. Um, so, and another, another point that I'd like to make is when you do crunches on the floor, actually, you're not working your abdominals properly anyway. Your abdominals have a front function to take your body from spinal extension into spinal, spinal flexion or trunk flexion, which basically means that um, you can do it on a Swiss ball, but on the floor, your body, doesn't have the, uh, your, your body doesn't have the ability to go underneath the floor, unfortunately, so it can't go into extension. Um, so it, it's got a poor range of motion anyway. And a lot of you guys will, will, will notice that when you're doing crunches, men especially, you'll find that you move backwards on the floor, so you slide backwards. So you'll then get those crazy things where you hoop your feet on any things. And I actually see trainers holding on to clients' feet while they do crunches. The fact that you're moving backwards proves to me that your hip flexors oh, yeah. are doing most of the work. Now, the problem with that is that if you get tight hip flexors, coupled with your bum not working properly, you get what's called anterior pelvic tilt, which is in ladies an absolute nightmare. Now, I want you to put yourself in the position of um, CSI Miami, or CSI wherever, and I want you to put yourself in the position of your, your internal organs. Now, your internal organs can sit inside your pelvis, or your viscera sits just inside your pelvis. Your, your pelvis is shaped like a bucket. Now, I want you to imagine somebody at the front of the bucket pulling down, somebody at the back of the bucket pulling down. Now, the person at the back represents your glute. That doesn't work, remember. And the person at the front represents your hip flexor, which is being overworked or your group of muscles called the hip flexor. And the person at the front is obviously so much stronger than the person at the back. So what happens is the bucket tips forward. Guess what happens to those internal organs, no? The spill out, the spill out of the front. Go on. What happens is a lot of uh, ladies who have that pouch right. at the front of their stomach, I actually have clients that have, have full pack abdominals and then have a, uh, almost a stick out stomach. Now a lot of people would say, oh that's me lower abdominal, so I need to do lower, lower abdominal work. For me that's absolute bull as well. Um, when, they, when they have this pouch just underneath the belly button, they'll say it's water retention, they'll say it's stubborn fat. It's actually their internal organs pushing against the lower abdominal wall, um, which is also known as anterior pelvic tilt. So that sticky out tummy that you've got is only going to be, be made worse by doing loads and loads of crunches because it's going to make the hip flexor do too much work. 
Um, so what we need to do is reverse that by squeezing the glutes and stretching the hip flexor. Point made, I think. <laughs> Again, no, no amount of no amount of really? sit-ups in will give you a flat stomach anyway, because number one, it doesn't burn enough calories. Number two, you've got too much fat over the top of them anyway. Everybody has a six-pack. You just need to get the fat off the top. To do that, you need to turn your body into a fat-burning machine yeah. by nailing the diet, by doing exercises yeah. that create the most metabolic disturbance, namely anaerobic interval training and resistance training. <laughs> so and there's exactly. enough ways to screw up your exactly. back anyway, isn't there, in daily life, by doing it's the gym as well? It's too much of an imbalance and it's pretty much... Over. And let's face it, nobody really likes doing them anyway. The both. So true. that, 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 that true. basically true. summed it up in, in, in one thing, that, that little bit at the end there. Stay away from crunches and create as much metabolic disturbance as you can and absolutely nail your diet. So, final question, Paul. What are your three most My, favorite abdominal this exercises? This is going to sound really bizarre, um, but I've got a few favorite abdominal exercises. My favorite abdominal exercise is a squat. Um, a, a squat with weight on your back okay. is the best abdominal exercise you can do. Your abdominals have to work harder doing squats and deadlifts than they do doing any other exercise. Um, but for a beginner, that's not really that um, not that helpful to them because they're not going to be squatting with um, barbells on the back. Unless they're doing body pull, of course. Um, however, um, my favourite abdominal exercise is a simple plank, um, which is basically holding your body parallel to the floor, you're on your forearms on the floor, toes on the floor, everything else off the floor, body in a straight line. Um, that has been shown to um, yeah. sorry, aggravate the abdominals more than crunches do anyway. Um, and my other favourite abdominal exercise is hmm, what's called a Spider-Man climb. It's basically a moving plank. Um, absolutely awesome exercise. And again, we will get these videos on the main site. We're just teasing you with these descriptions. Um, but those are my favourite abdominal exercise because they don't involve lying on the floor, nodding your head. They don't involve taking your body through a limited range of motion. And they activate the abdominals more than anything else. Because I think it's still really important to get some strength in the abdominals. But you won't, you won't tone your abdominals by doing more abdominal yes. exercises. Yeah. When your body chooses to drop fat, it drops in molecule by molecule from all over the body, um, not from the area. Um, now you've listened to this call, get out there, try a few things that Paul's mentioned, and uh, let us know how you get on. Speak soon. No. <laughs>